Welcome back to the Carl Crusher channel. I've got a jam-packed episode for you today. If you haven't watched the last episode, make sure and go check that one out where we dig into some of the history of Mount Wilson Ranch surrounding Area 51. And we're gonna go a lot deeper today because I've uncovered more evidence out of that Jacques Vallée book, Fast Walker, plus more historical evidence out of the Wilson Davis memo that ties all of this together from Roswell to Mount Wilson Ranch and the original owners that go clear back to the 1940s, and it's gonna get weird. But another anomaly was that the bismuth magnesium layer... Actually, I've exhausted every resource that I have uh, ever tried to use in the past. Where it talks about not made by human hands, not of this earth, and so on. These are 13 pages of typed notes written by Dr. Eric Davis in 2002 when he was a member of the National Institute of Discovery Science, that's NIDS, owned and managed by billionaire Robert Bigelow. One of his pieces that we looked at together when I visited was magnesium bismuth. Bismuth layers less than human hair, supposedly picked up in the crash retrieval of an advanced aerospace vehicle. And study pieces of material that may have been stashed away for decades yes, after being retrieved from the sites of close encounters. Elizondo says there are legitimate reasons why the military and now private groups are in a race to figure out these materials. There is a ranch in Nevada near Area 51 that was secretly researched by Bob Bigelow's original Skinwalker Ranch team of psychic spies. For decades, while simultaneously researching Skinwalker Ranch, the NIDS team was searching for the lost entrance into a giant cave system of ancient alien artifacts. An abandoned alien mining operation leading to a 500-foot underground pyramid hiding a UFO nicknamed the Mount Wilson Manta Ray. For thousands of years, indigenous people have known and protected its secrets. For decades, top secret government teams, even before Ronald Reagan's Star Wars program, were scouring the ranch attempting to recover the metamaterials, biological material, and ancient unknown artifacts, and were stopped by an explosion of paranormal activity. Animal mutilations, alien abductions, poltergeist activity, moving orbs of light and shadow figures, strange glitches in time, and the ghost of a Native American shot appearing alongside with three extraterrestrial beings who protect the land. Now, new leaked whistleblower evidence has confirmed the truth behind these local legends. New ancient artifacts are being discovered and mysterious energy is transmitting from the meadow and an undiscovered tunnel entrance has been found. Independent researchers, scientists, archaeologists, and Native American historians have joined me, Carl Crusher, to uncover the truth. We are on a mission to find the lost entrance into the underground and uncover the real mystery of Mount Wilson Ranch. In our last episode, we covered a lot of ground. It was a long video, a good 50 minutes long, but we went into some introductory information out of the book Fast Walker from Jacques Vallée. This is a book that he published in 1996 that came out at the exact same time as we have all this whistleblower evidence and photographic evidence of the NIDS team with Bob Bigelow, Jacques Vallée, Hal Putoff, Tim Ryan, Colm Kelleher, and several others of the team up at Mount Wilson Ranch in 1996, a year after the formation of NIDS. This is the exact same year that Bigelow also bought Skinwalker Ranch, and it's also the exact same year that the bismuth, the metamaterial, surfaced on Art Bell's desk. While a lot of the photographic evidence that we have of the NIDS team is up at Mount Wilson Ranch and at Skinwalker Ranch in 1996, that the reasons that they were up there is based on evidence that came out of the 1940s. We also have clips of Bob Lazar having gone into Area 51, allegedly, and saying on the Joe Rogan podcast that some of the craft that he witnessed, he was told were from an archaeological dig. I've never asked anyone that has any inkling of any idea of where they got them or how they got them. No, but um, something must have been said to me um, from Barry. And but I, I it was just too long ago and I, I can't quite remember what was said, but it it just left a seed in my mind. I think at least one of them was part of an archaeological dig. So it's old. 
something one at least one of them is old i don't know if it was the one i worked on but i remember something to do with an archaeological dig whoa so that's uh that means it's not just old it's ancient that'd be a great steven spielberg movie <laughs> yeah right <laughs> As all of it would. Another piece of the puzzle that's also very compelling to me is that we've been talking about the ancient indigenous culture and the evidence of why everyone was up at Mount Wilson Ranch as well. And I also got to talk to Roger Colty and Colleen Gorman of the Reindigenizing Minds Project. And we went into way more detail about the history around that. Reindigenizing Minds saying hello. <laughs> Yes, welcome everybody. This is uh, I've got Roger and Colleen of the Reindigenizing Minds Project. Please, they're doing they're doing a lot over on uh, their YouTube channel and on their Patreon page, where you can subscribe to get all of the in depth detail on all of this. This is what's crazy: is recently in my video series, I've uncovered a lot of evidence that shows that maybe Roswell was a cover story that they did a year later to hide the fact that they actually uncovered a UFO or some ancient material underground in an archaeological dig in Nevada. And when I talked to Roger and Colleen a minute ago, Roger's like, I've been trying to tell you this forever, Carl. What are you talking about? So <laughs> he's got some maps. And you're right. You have been trying to tell me that for almost a year now. And it's time to have it come forward that how this all lines up uh, to everything that you've been working on. Okay, I'll start real simple. Everybody's been hearing me use this term, astral longitudes. And I never defined it, but I'm going to define what an astral longitude is right now. An astral longitude are where a diagonal trade line goes this way, and a diagonal trade line goes the opposite way this way, and a trade line goes directly up, and a directly line goes this way across, and the astral longitude location is right dead center in that location. And what I'm learning about these astral longitudes is that they seem to be location for what the white man calls vortexes, portals, or whatever terms they want to use. There seems to be some electromagnetic disturbances where these uh, all intersect at this certain locations. And one of the certain locations goes right through Mount Wilson, through Mount Current, and right to the other side to Rawhide Mountain, and one of those. But if you do the diagonal side or the astral longitude diagonally, like from like what I'm showing up here, the diagonal side from one side going this way, yeah, going all the way across that so way. Like from 49 to 42. Yeah, 49 to 14 on the top, and then going diagonally, it's the same layout basically. But the layout is weird. It'd be the Dugaway testing range, That's then there'll be Mount Wilson, and then there would be uh, Area 51, 45. and then China Lake, and then Edwards Air Force Base, all in a straight diagonal line on an astral longitude. I cannot figure this out because uh, all these other locations are ancient locations, but this one is all modern, and Mount Wilson is part of that alignment. Not only that, Mont Wilson on the other diagonal alignment is the same thing, except it's ancient. This template is, I'm going to explain real simple. This is what I call, it's a, cross, a trade cross template. Why I call it a trade cross? If you look uh, in the middle, you'll see cross figures that are inside of it that are blank. Now, all these crosses going all the way across it with latitudes and longitudes on it. So if you look real closely, you notice that there are crosses this is all contained within the empire. This is my empire that I'm aware of, and that is part of my people. Well, that's what it is to know. And if you notice the crosses and keep paying attention to those crosses, yeah, you're going right. See where Tamaku is? You keep following that, it'll take you to Monte Albon, Oaxaca. It'll take you to Teotihuacan. It'll take you to Lovelock Cave. Lovelock Cave, Nevada, where the giants were. I wonder where that is, which is right next to Mount Wilson. And all of those things that your archaeologist friend are showing that people are saying, that looks Aztec. It is. It's, a, it's part of the trade network, and it was traded with the people down there in Teotihuacan. That's why there's such beautiful arrowheads and spears, but uh, Mount Wilson is just the hub of uh, that something that's down there. It's 
it's just a, a part of an attachment to a larger facility that extends from it on the other side of the mountain range going west. What's on the other side of the mountain range going west from Mount Wilson? Area 51 and the entire Nevada test site. Mm -hmm. uh, Groom Lake wasn't built to rebuild ancient technology that they recovered from Roswell. Groom Lake was built on top of an ancient structure to hide it so they could uh, archaeologically dig it at their own leisure and look at things without anybody coming in to disturb them while they were doing the archaeological digs, let alone the um, what would you call the back engineering of it to see how they work. And Bob yeah. Lazar it was part of the work of these archaeological digs of what they were bringing out from this location. And his job was to find out how they worked. So when we have the original owners of Mount Wilson Ranch in 1946, starting the first mining collective in Pioch, Nevada, and then the owner, E.L. Norris, goes from a nobody to a senator in 1949. And in 47, the Roswell crash happened. But we're finding a lot of evidence that that's a cover story to hide what really happened in Nevada. Who else put a mining claim there, Carl? Think real hard. Howard Hughes had hundreds of mining he claims. Was he yeah. wasn't there looking for mining. He was there for the same reason that we're talking about, trying to retrieve what might be left down in there. He wasn't there digging for gold. He was into aerospace technology. When I get my Patreon totally activated, I'm actually going to be willing to share my personal charts from my book with the people and that Patreon that are willing to be serious enough and those people that come on my Patreon, I want them to be part of my teamwork. What I haven't told anybody yet is that I'm trying to get the ebook and all that out, which everybody's aware of. What I would like to do is create a team of natives and non-natives to further this research. If you guys want to be a part of it, make sure and go to the Reindigenizing Minds Patreon. I'll put all the links down in the description below so you can yep. go take part of it. Let's go back to the 1940s. E.L. Norris one of the original owners of Mount Wilson Ranch throughout the 1940s. Now, we don't have a lot of information about E.L. Norris, but we do know that he supposedly married a wealthy woman, and that's how he got his initial finances in order to form one of the first major mining collectives in the state of Nevada up around Pioch. Suddenly, after forming this mining collective in the late 1940s, he becomes a senator of Nevada. He goes from a nobody to a senator. So what happened at Mount Wilson Ranch after he formed the mining collective where he went from a nobody to all of a sudden a state senator? Let's not forget that this happened in 1946 and the Roswell crash supposedly happened in 1947. E.L. Norris is made a senator in Nevada in 1949. All of these weird dates line up with some kind of an archeological dig happening in Nevada. Now. If we jump forward to the book by Jacques Vallée in 1996, Fast Walker, all of the evidence in that book is a fictional story that takes place in Nevada that indicates that what happened in Roswell was actually a decoy that was staged events in order to hide what really occurred at an archaeological dig at the base of a mountain in Nevada. Mr. X, former top government scientist, I cannot reveal my identity. There are forces that would kill to keep the real facts from the public and from the media. Um, it happened last summer in a remote part of Nevada, the man said in a tone of utter discouragement. The top scientific specialists had been brought together to work on Star Wars technology. You know, it was a secret black program, but the project that paid our salary was only a cover. The truth is, they were trying to capture a, a complete working saucer. They had already recovered bits of hardware and humanoid bodies stored there in an underground base. The debris was recovered back in the 40s, and, and I know it's real because I saw it with my own eyes. I'm not saying that Roswell didn't happen, and I'm also not saying that Roswell isn't part of a big cover-up. I'm saying that there's layers to this like an onion, and we know for a fact that there's a lot of evidence that the predecessors to the MX missile program and the Star Wars program were already up at Mount Wilson Ranch clear back in the 1940s.
during an early radar missile defense program called Project Bambi. And the evidence of the original owners clear back in the 1940s at Mount Wilson seemed to line up perfectly with that. And then we, uh, we found some debris, Trent concluded. All broken up, but some of it still worked. It came crashing down in the desert. A rancher stumbled upon it. <laughs> 1947, right? New Mexico? I read about it. No, Pete, what you read was just the cover story, a blind alley. The real pieces were picked up the year before. Jesus, and you people have had all the answers for over 50 years? Wrong again, Pete. It was one piece of the puzzle, but not the smoking gun. You see, we could never reassemble the thing. After years of trying in our labs, the hardware was taken from us and shipped somewhere else. We think it's in Nevada. With what's left of the crew, Junko added. You mean, Keller felt the blood drain from his face. Yes, she said. The craft was broken up, but several of the aliens were alive. Even in the book Fast Walker, when the characters of the book go to New Mexico, where the Roswell incident happened, they only do that in order to pick up someone or go to California and pick another person up. And then they go back to Nevada, across Nevada state lines. And in the story, it's like they even go to the little alien, grab a bite of food. They drive on the dirt road for another couple of hours and they wind up what sounds like right at Mount Wilson Ranch. And then the shocking thing is, what they encounter when they get there is this aircraft comes and lands. It sounds exactly like what Jeff and I have seen when we've gone and drove down that same dirt road on the way from Mount Wilson Ranch to Area 51. We've seen the same aircraft. Ellis's pickup was racing in the desert again. Denton was driving and Rachel and Peter sat near him yawning. Keller even slept for a while, once opening his eyes in time to catch a blurred view of a sign that read, Entering Nevada. They kept driving in silence, stopping only at a tiny roadside cafe set up in an old trailer. After that, the pickup left the asphalt and turned down a barren, rocky dirt trail. It was now mid-afternoon. Rachel looked out at the road with eager anticipation. It seemed to run straight into a hellish-looking mountain range, and there was not a living thing in sight. They had driven a few more hours, and sunset was approaching when they saw a jeep in the distance ahead of them, parked by the side of the highway. You saw the underground base, right? Where is it, Ellis? Ellis reluctantly walked forward until he was outside the mouth of the canyon. He pointed across the rolling sand to an oddly shaped hill on the far horizon. I might as well tell you, it's, it's partially artificial. We called it Pyramid Mountain. The facility you're looking for is directly below it. He suddenly tensed. Did you hear something? Peter spun around to see a low-flying black machine coming straight at them. It was ominously, eerily quiet, a cross between an airplane and a jet helicopter. It touched down a few scant yards beyond their position. Ellis began to back away, frozen in fear. He watched the doors of the craft open and its two occupants climb out. They pivot off of the events that happened in the late 1940s when a pilot out of Nellis Air Force Base apparently was taking off and witnessed a UFO, a giant flying saucer, go into the base of a mountain in Nevada and disappear. All the characters of the story are trying to get back into this hidden underground base in Nevada. And all of this pivots around a distraction where they use a journalist out of Las Vegas in order to plant material to make everything sound like it happened in Roswell when it really happened at an archeological dig back in the 40s in Nevada at a place near Area 51. All of this seems to line up with the events that occurred historically at Mount Wilson Ranch and the fact that the entire NIDS team with Bigelow and Eric Davis, Hal Putoff, Jacques Vallée, and all of the major players were up there at Mount Wilson Ranch and the dots connect for the same time as the meta material showing up with Art Bell in Las Vegas. Even the fact that the meta materials showed up at Art Bell's desk in a shoebox in Las Vegas was written about in Jacques Bellet's book, Fast Walker, when they talk about picking a reporter and handpicking him to be able to tell the story and revealing part of the clues of the evidence to him as they go along. And it gets pretty mind blowing. Colonel Trent put it in plain business terms. 
Convince Mr. X to meet with us, and the story rights are yours, Pete. Yours exclusively. <laughs> you people really know how to push the right buttons, don't you? Said Killer. That's what we do best, said the Colonel. Let's not forget that the Wilson Davis memo that came out seems to indicate that Admiral Wilson tried to get access to UFO crash recovery materials and research projects where they were reverse engineering these UFOs and flying saucers, as well as bodies, alien bodies. And Eric Davis, who we have photographs of up at Mount Wilson Ranch as part of the original NIDS team with the team with Bigelow, going to Admiral Wilson trying to sort this out and how this is all part of this sub compartmentalized secret access program that not even Admiral Wilson can get access to anymore. I'm not going to go through the entire thing. There is five hour long breakdowns on Richard Dolan's channel and ongoing conversations about this, whether it's real or not. But what it is, is it's a conversation that happened between Eric Davis and Admiral Wilson about the secrecy of the UFO crash retrieval program and the reverse engineering program and how they're trying to crack into that program and find out what happened and who did it. This document allegedly was created or this meeting happened in 1997, one year after or possibly just months after the photographs that we have them all up at Mount Wilson Ranch. We know it was written by Eric Davis. Um, but it was probably written on the date it was written is at the top of the document, 10 02 or October 16th, 2002. Um, from there, we know that it was distributed confidentially to some of Dr. Eric Davis's closest colleagues who explicitly trusted many of them who we know held security clearances, SCI clearances. Um, you know, many of them had intelligence backgrounds. Um, the two individuals I'm most confident that he shared it with were most likely Dr. Harold Puttoff, who either was at the time or would um, eventually become his employer at Earth Tech in Austin. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Dr. Edgar Mitchell. I mean, it makes perfect sense that he would share it with Edgar Mitchell because Edgar Mitchell had been a science advisor to the same organization Eric Davis had worked for. Well, I eventually went to uh, the Pentagon and asked for a meeting with the Intelligence uh, Committee of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which I got with another naval officer who had had many similar experiences. And uh, uh, we told our story. And this gentleman, a um, vice admiral, uh, said to us, well, I don't know about that, but I'm going to find out. And called a few weeks later and said he had found the source of the, of the black budget funding for this project and that he was going to subsequently investigate because if it was real, he should know about it. As a back, matter of fact, he should be in charge. That was his words. And so we did get calls from him sometime later and a report much later than that, that he had found uh, the people responsible for the cover up and for the people who were in the know and were told, I'm sorry, Admiral, you do not have uh, uh, need to know here. And so goodbye. All right, Bill. So what, so what are you saying? So did you, first of all, did you interview these people on their deathbed or under oath? Okay. I want the viewer. I mean, I'm not going to no, change I your mind. So that's for a go for that. Then, you know, you said they sought me out referred they to a vice president. Out. They sought him out. Okay, you, well, yeah, but they were not on their deathbed. A deathbed declaration is quite a different thing from seeking you out and telling a story. Hey, I mean, I just, this is not no, for you. I'm, I'm not, not going to convince no, you. I am not interested in arguing with you. I'm telling my story. If you okay, want to yeah. shut up and hear it, I'll be glad to talk. Otherwise, no. Okay, I'm, I'm claiming that you haven't made a claim about aliens. You made a claim am, about a cover-up, which I'm right there with you. And you made a claim about an admiral who was not given clearance to read it. I right there with you on that. But go ahead about the aliens. In the in the community was they were of what it was that it was a alien craft, and that survived all of the other uh, stories and all of the other uh, oaths and so forth. It was there for a long time. He meets with them. They tell him 
yes, we're ver- reverse engineering an alien or a craft that is not made by human hands, not by, not by man, not of this world. And we've made painfully slow progress in understanding it. Wilson says, well, I want in. They're like, no, you're not coming in. He says, well, you're wrong. They show him a list of known as the Bigot list, B-I-G-O-T, derived from World War II. doesn't mean bigotry. It means something totally different. And the, that's a list of who's in and who's out or who's in. And it's roughly 500 people. And he notices they're all corporate contractors. Almost none of them are DOD people. And he says, well, I need in. And they're like, no, you're not coming in. Well, what are your criteria? Well, we don't have to tell you our criteria, except you're not in. Well, I'm going to go complain. I said, be our guest, complain, see, see, what we'll, see if we care. And uh, they actually said, the only reason we're meeting with you now is because we were nearly outed a few years ago during a Pentagon audit. And we had the auditor uh, nearly exposed us and we had to read him in. Anyway, so Wilson goes back and he does complain. And he's threatened with his career and it pisses him off, but he's like, what can I do? So he's, he was told, like, if you want to complain, you will take an early retirement. You'll probably lose a couple of stars along the way and don't think about becoming head of DIA. Mitchell reports back to his people. Who are his people? The NIDS people under Robert Bigelow. Mitchell was on the board. So was Putoff. So was Kit Green. So was Eric Davis. All of these people. They are all of them. What is their mission? Their mission is they want to get to the center of the labyrinth. That's all they want to do. They, they have security clearances. They know Kit Green's another one. They know a lot, but they don't know everything that they want to know. That's, that's a fact. So they send, so they knew about this for five years through Mitchell. And in 2002, when Mitchell, when Wilson retired from the DIA, goes into private industry. It might have even been before he got hired by ATK, um, which is where he got hired. Davis, Eric Davis is sent out to interview Wilson. Davis goes and he hits a home run interview. He sits with Wilson. He writes 13 pages of notes that are typewritten, 13 pages. Wilson, Davis, Wilson, Davis. They're paraphrased notes, but they're detailed because that's how Davis is. He's a brilliant physicist. He's extremely detail-oriented. Where I spoke to him. He might, he might have recorded it. He might have transcribed it just from notes. I don't know. So what does he do? He gives it to his colleagues in NIDS. He gives it to... Green and Putoff and Mitchell and all those guys. In 2006, a long time ago. Um, we don't know for sure if he is speaking about the specific Fluxliner ARV alien reproduction vehicle that was witnessed in person by Bradford Sorensen and Lockheed's hangar in Palmdale in the 1980s or if he is just referencing, you know, alien reproduction vehicles or back engineered vehicles. Yes, a good point. Is it a generic term or is he actually referring to the specific, the ARV story uh, connected with uh, Brad Sorensen and um, made public really by Mark McCandlish through Stephen Greer um, in Greer's book on um, uh, called Disclosure from about 20 years ago. It's a famous story among researchers and it's one that I personally uh, place credence in, and it's this uh, claim, this idea that the U.S. black budget community had been working on these craft for a long time, and even by 1988 that they had had definite success, some level of success, in creating their version of these, hence the phrase, alien reproduction vehicle, ARV. Looking at that, I started looking at the things that Hal Putoff had said. In the middle of last century, um, physicists made an astounding uh, uh, discovery, and that is what we ordinarily consider an empty space isn't empty at all. Even if you go to the far reaches of outer space, it turns out that rather than emptiness, what we call the vacuum <clears throat> is really a seething cauldron of what we call quantum energy or zero-point energy. It was predicted uh, by the mathematics of quantum theory, but the numbers were so large. For example, there's enough energy in the volume of a coffee cup to evaporate the world's oceans. It was thought, well, this must be some kind of artifact in the theory. But as time went on, uh, various predictions in quantum theory um, were verified in the laboratory. And it finally turned out we had to take these numbers seriously. It's it's too far. They, They just can't get from here to there. Um, we might explore our own solar system, but that's probably as far as we're going to get. 
But the truth of the matter is that in general relativity, uh, that's not not the case. There are options there. Um, that limitation now has begun to evaporate due to the new understandings and predictions coming out of general relativity. So that's not the issue. It was Kit Green who is well, he's close to his people. He's part of their extended network. You know, he worked with them exclusively, very closely in the past. You know, he was involved in put-offs, remote viewing work, you know, all these, all this stuff that happened in the 70s. Right. There was an official program to study UFOs. As the I-Team first reported, one of the Pentagon programs was carried out here by Bass, a subcontractor within Bigelow Aerospace, financed by the DIA. And the chief scientist for Bass was physicist Dr. Hal Putoff. Hal was working with the DIA study through Bass, and as well as the chief scientific officer for the two stars as a civilian uh, effort in the field. So yeah, I, I should mention he was also participated in the study that I ran 30 years ago. Las Vegas John Alexander, a former military intelligence colonel, has likewise been pursuing the UFO mystery for decades. It's no accident he invited Dr. Putoff to speak here, given the recent explosion of media interest in the Pentagon's UFO study. On Friday, Putoff will tell what he knows about that study. It's one of the highlights from the joint conference of IRVA, the International Remote View Association, and SSE, the Society for Scientific Exploration. Both groups include professionals who believe the study of unconventional subjects is a worthy pursuit. That is the key point, is that these people are highly credible, highly skilled, uh, many professors, lots of PhDs and MDs uh, that are involved and they do want to look at, or are certainly willing to look at this wide range of society. They're not all proponents. I mean, I mean that. I mean, some of them are true skeptics, um, but you know, they are willing to look at the data. The conference is not a gathering of true believers. For example, one SSE member, Dr. Gary Nolan of Stanford, recently demolished claims by pitch men that this skeleton found in Chile is a mummified extraterrestrial. It's a deformed human, Nolan proved. Remote viewing is a protocol developed for the CIA and tested by the U.S. Army. Dr. Putoff helped create the CIA's remote viewing program, but for this event, we'll focus on the Pentagon's UFO studies. So when people say, isn't it interesting the Pentagon is doing this, my question is, why aren't we seeing more? George Knapp, 8 News Now. There's a lot of questions that have to do with Eric Davis and his involvement with the Wilson Davis memo and how Putoff's name is mentioned in there, Bigelow's name is mentioned in there, and it's all inter entwined into this. And for some reason, all of these guys are in pictures up at Mount Wilson Ranch in 1996, the same time as the metamaterials surfacing an Art Bell's desk in Las Vegas. It was in the spring of 1996 that I was doing all of those weekly reports with Art Bell for Coast to Coast and we were even doing Dreamland together so sometimes it would be two or three programs a week. And Art called me up and said I've gotten a, an amazing package. It came with this letter. This is letter number one. I followed your broadcast over the last year or so and have been considering whether or not to share with you and your listeners some information related to the Roswell, New Mexico UFO crash, but it really is not the location of Roswell Corona. Quote, my grandfather was a member of the retrieval team sent to the crash site just after the incident was reported. He died in 1974, but not before he had sat down with some of us and talked about the incident. I am currently serving in the United States military and hold a security clearance and do not wish to go public and risk losing my career and commission. Nonetheless, I would like to briefly tell you what my own grandfather told me about Roswell. And just keep in mind, Roswell has become sort of a, a lump ball when the Majestic 12 documents, which I'll be talking about in my lecture tomorrow, going specifically into what in the Majestic 12 documents the 800 classified pages, the 3,000 unclassified that Bob and Ryan Wood have accumulated over the last decade would justify a policy of denial about anything other than human interacting with our planet and making it stick. And the source clarified in another letter that the vehicle was, quote, a wedge-shaped disc. 
Now, those are contradictory terms, but just like people throwing Roswell as a jump or uh, like a sack for everything, they wedge shaped disc. A disc becomes sort of a substitute in a lot of people's language for UFO, but that the shape was wedge shaped. The South Carolina writer said that his grandfather was on a security team to retrieve this wedge shaped disc and three non-human bodies, two dead and one alive. And this is a recreation by an artist who worked with three people in military on coming up with a aerial vehicle composite of three testimonies uh, that might be something similar to the wedge-shaped vehicle. However, I neglected to include metallic samples of the exterior of the crashed Roswell disc. I now include the enclosed and can only say that these scrapings came from the exterior underside of the disc itself. It literally was a shell-like shielding of the disc, brittle and layered almost with a prefabricated design and placing. Keep in mind that these are the last of granddad's samples. They have sat for years inside a closet with his personal effects. Because of certain concerns, I will not be contacting you on this matter. Perhaps I am a bit paranoid, but I do have a family and a career to think about. I hope you understand. I hope these last samples are helpful. And of course, I will be listening, unquote. And Art called me and said there were half a dozen pieces about two inches long, an inch wide, and about a quarter of an inch thick. And I proceeded to contact a university professor who, uh, as long as I did not identify him, agreed to analyze the new material. And uh, Art shipped some fragments to him. I had some. And Art kept four whole ones in a safe deposit box. She tells the story of how it arrives on Art Bell's desk from coast to coast AM and how she went down there and arrived at his desk in 1996 in a shoebox full of tissue paper. She goes on the Coast to Coast AM radio show. And then after that show, a scientist calls in and it just so happens to be Travis Taylor. On the radio, I asked for research help. An electrical engineer and physicist, Travis Taylor at the Ar Army's Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama, called me up and said he would volunteer to do such an experiment. But he said first that he had to ask his superiors and contacts who were the Defense Intelligence Agency, if it was all right to work with me on this bismuth magnesium. And he came back to me and he said it was such an interesting conversation because the DIA people seemed to know who I was already they seem to have some information about all this. And they said that they would approve his working with me as long as he, Travis, kept them informed about what we learned. He said, I had the distinct impression they did not know what this was either. Actually, I've exhausted every resource that I have uh, ever tried to use in the past. Uh, from about 1940 to, to now, and I have found no reference, uh, even in the government uh, research, uh, for bismuth magnesium layers. Is that a sound up? Because you got to hear the snap crackle. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, my God, you're missing. I mean, this is I mean, it's making all kinds of, okay, you just saw that go off. Well, you're missing being able to hear the physicist talk about, he now is talking about what he's doing, which he was so amazed at seeing that there was any motion at all. And uh, he started trying to see if he put his fingers, he's trying to come down through the fields that would be around the plastic cap trying to see if he can cause the motion. And uh, in a moment, uh, you will see him, he takes a piece of aluminum cap and as a control. And you can still see on this, the bismuth magnesium never stopped uh, fluttering, moving, and especially the sideways motions, both in a 500,000 volt. And then a month later, 
He did it with a million. Something fascinating about this clip is that we realize that not only did Travis Taylor get invited by Jay Stratton to join the UAP task force while he was actively on the History Channel TV show, The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, but now we learn from this interview that he was a member of the Defense Intelligence Agency at least as long back as 2004. Travis Taylor should also get primary credit for being the first person after Linda to handle and scientifically try to test and analyze this bismuth or metamaterials and potentially what it could be. I've heard that after that, it was given back to Linda Moulton Howe, and then it went from her to Hal Putoff. Hal Putoff is the individual at To The Stars Academy working with Tom DeLong right now that has the metamaterial. There was an interview on Coast to Coast AM with him and Eric Davis. The same Eric Davis from the Wilson Davis memo is was on Coast to Coast AM with Hal Putoff and they talked about handling and seeing this metamaterial. Where did they get the metamaterial from? How come they're talking about it on Coast to Coast AM and all the same players seems to be involved? You have Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp sitting behind David Grush and Commander Fravor during the congressional hearings talking about recovered craft, biological material and metamaterial. And it's like they're referencing Hal Putoff. Hal Putoff is the individual in these photos at Mount Wilson Ranch. And it's like all of these pieces are fitting together. It's even Jeremy Corbell and Bob Lazar that are referencing Bigelow in the Wilson Davis memo. And it's Eric Davis in the photos with Bigelow, Jacques Vallée, Hal Putoff, and all the rest of the gang. And they're at Mount Wilson Ranch. We have more photographic evidence and timeline evidence, including the fictional book Fast Walker that lines up with everything at Mount Wilson Ranch being the place where metamaterials were recovered more than anywhere else at this point. So tell me somebody who knows what the Dirac equation is, like a pretty low bar for a physicist. There is no one. And I don't quite mean no one, but do you know who Eric W. Davis is? No. You ever heard of the Wilson memo? No. Okay, there's something called the Wilson Memo where there's a physicist who meets an, a general or an admiral, and the general or the admiral is trying to figure out, I think this is at EG and G, um, why is there some program that I'm not allowed to know about? I have the highest clearances, I have a need to know. I'm like, sorry, we can't tell you. He's talking to somebody named Eric W. Davis. Eric W. Davis, so far as I can find, is the only person other than maybe Hal Putoff, who I've been able to talk to, who speaks anything of these languages. This is not a particularly famous physicist. Hal Putoff is an electrical engineer, I think a PhD in electrical engineering. Eric W. Davis says to me, I said, is, is there nobody out here who speaks physics? This doesn't make any sense. And he says, well, you, Hal, and I are the three most technical people on this. Joe, I'm not even on this. So you know as much about it as anyone, and you're not even involved. And there's only two other people that know <laughs> the science and, and, and like one of them is into remote viewing and, oh. and, and was a Scientologist. Um, so this bismuth, this metamaterial is still at the central focus of the UFO whistleblower and congressional hearings that are going on with David Grush, with Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp sitting behind him right there in front of Congress. And they talk about UFO metamaterials. And in these same interviews and podcasts with Grush, we have Hal Putoff and Gary Nolan and these same people that all revolve around NIDS and To The Stars Academy with Tom DeLong are still utilizing these same bismuth parts and same meta materials. Uh, it's kind of weird where, as far as I know, in my kind of you know, topological physics history knowledge where you know, there was all these anti-grav groups up until the early 60s and then they, you know, totally vaporized. You know that there's physics knowledge held by aerospace companies that is not there known. certainly is materials knowledge materials well okay material which science. involves topological physics or whatever that's gary nolan stanford microbiologist and nobel nominee who claims to have ufo crash parts with isotope ratios that don't occur naturally on earth one of his pieces that we looked at together when i visited was magnesium bismuth 
bismuth layers of less than the human hair, supposedly picked up in the crash retrieval of an advanced aerospace vehicle. Nowhere could we find any evidence that anybody ever made one of these. I propose either came from Roswell or from Mount Wilson Ranch from the archaeological dig in the 1940s. And then NIDS went back up there in 1996. And throughout that decade, they had the bulldozer back up there in the meadow. They were reaccessing the tunnels from E.L. Norris mining days from Project Bambi, the MX missile program and Ronald Reagan's Star Wars program. And we have Bigelow and his entire team going back up there trying to recover these metamaterials. And even though a lot of this story happens and ties in with Edgar Mitchell and the crash in Roswell, there was multiple layers of events that happened that created an entire shell game around the metamaterials, the UFO uh, recovery and reverse engineering programs that suddenly kicked off all back at the end of the 1940s and the entire realm of secrecy around all of this. I find it highly compelling that the dots seem to connect all the way back to the 1940s, clear back into the interesting events of Project Paperclip, the formation of the early aerospace and engineering programs around Lockheed and the Area 51. And you have the same players from the uh, founding of Mount Wilson Ranch and the mining collective that took E.L. Norris from a nobody to a senator, and then fast forward all the way up through, and you've got the formation of the NIDS team trying to go back through and recover metamaterials in 1996, the exact same year as the metamaterials show up at Art Bell's desk. And then the first person to get a handle on them is Travis Taylor in 2004. And then ever since then, these exact same metamaterials are still at To The Stars Academy with Hal Putoff and Gary Nolan, and they're revolving around the entire UFO whistleblower hearings in front of Congress to this day. Is it really possible that this entire UFO whistleblower hearing has to do with the bismuth that was sent to Art Bell in a shoebox? And is the Wilson Davis memo really just also from a shoebox from Edgar Mitchell. It's really difficult to know and to sort out how much of this is real, how much of it is fiction, if the MJ-12 documents are real or if they're part of a decoy or deception, and also if the Wilson Davis memo is real or part of the same pattern um, just being perpetrated by a different group. But if I had to guess and give my own personal opinion, it seems to me like the names and the dates of everything lines up that something absolutely significant happened. It fits in with all of the story that Project Bambi, the MX missile program, the Star Wars program, Bigelow's uh, NIDS team was up at Mount Wilson Ranch and they were all up there at the exact same right days and times in order for this meta material to turn up and also for this memo to come out with Admiral Wilson trying to trace down what happened to this UFO crash retrieval program where they recovered an intact UFO with alien bodies. And it had to do with Roswell and also with Jacques Vallée indicating that it didn't happen in Roswell, but a lot of this actually happened in Nevada. This entire topic is a really deep rabbit hole and we're going to try to circle around it as many which ways as we can, but I don't think we're done with Mount Wilson Ranch. We're not done with the connections that it has with Roswell, all the names and the dates and everybody that connects. And we're going to keep digging into this. Not only that, I'm going to be going back up to Mount Wilson Ranch, guest appearing on some other really cool prominent podcasts and doing some cool stuff upcoming. So make sure and subscribe, turn on notifications. We're going to keep digging into this. ATIP never ended. Nope. It's still going on today. Yep. Change names, change location, change leadership. So oh, what's, the new, goes on. what's the new name? I can't tell you that. <laughs> My boss went to report to Lou at the Pentagon in the OUSDI offices during the ATIP era. So that's right. You know who my boss is? Hal Putoff, right? Dr. Hal Putoff. Right. So your boss reported to Lou. Yeah. And I've been over there too. I didn't report to Lou. I wasn't involved with Lou at that time, but I've been, I've been involved with the new management. So are you, are you guys still investigating UFOs at the Pentagon? 
uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, of course. They've, they never went away. Let me stop you yeah. right there, because when you say that craft, what you mean is the supposed UFO wreckage that crashed in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. That's yes. what you mean, right? Yes. But that was never supposedly taken to Area 51. It was supposed to be taken to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The legend has it that Truman flew there to meet them, and right? That's one legend. Yeah. So in my book, I interview a man who worked for the Atomic Energy Commission who tells a different story tells the story of receiving that craft at Area 51 in 1951, which is why the base is called Area 51. Oh. And that inside the craft were humans who had been altered, surgically altered to look like aliens in a plan for Stalin to sort of twist Truman's arm, because at that time, we had the atomic bomb. When Roswell happened, we had the atomic bomb, and the Soviets did not. So can I stop you there? Yeah. When you say humans that were surgically altered to look like aliens, do, yeah. do, do you mean... So this is 1951. So yes. you're talking about four years after the supposed crash. Yes. So what... They what had was the bodies, left? they kept the bodies. They, they kept the bodies. Them. In what? And Formaldehyde? Like what, yes. How? And also because the idea was... And remember... Or I can't say remember because you haven't read the book yet. Right. And I wrote this book eight years ago. Mm. Um, but it did really impact a lot of my a lot of my thinking and working on on you know government secrecy projects because it makes you really consider what a hoax means mm -hmm. and what it means to a population of people and how the government begins to work with disinformation versus cover stories and all of that. But going back to answer your question, that is what I was told by the source. That But how reliable is this source? This is a very incendiary idea mm -hmm. to rely upon one individual's mm -hmm. recollection of it. Which is why the book went through the roof in terms of people being upset about it. I, I was interviewing nuclear weapons engineers who were setting off nuclear bombs in Area 51, mm -hmm. mushroom, I mean, in the Nevada test site, Area 12, Area 23. Mm -hmm. And they all said to me, you've got to talk to the top engineer of all this weaponry. And they gave me his name. And we talked for days and hours about nuclear weapons. And then in one conversation, he began to cry and told me this story that I was like, Whoa. what? What? Why was he crying? He was crying because he participated in our version of the human experiments. Because what the Russians do, we do. Look, I've written so five books we, about this. We altered people to make them look like aliens? According to him, we had a small program in 1951 where we wanted to see how the Russians did what they did. How they made human beings look like this. So what they do? Take prisoners or something? Like what? Uh, who do they alter? He said they were handicapped children. Oh, Jesus. And he told me that he participated in this. So again, I mean, unless you have someone that lost their mind at age 90 and was willing to tell their wife of 65 years, I lost my mind. So he's saying that he participated in something that altered handicapped children. When you say handicapped, mm -hmm. you mean like Down syndrome or something mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. And they made them look like aliens and then killed them? Like what did? Uh, how did they? What did they do with this? This is where we get into drops of information coming mm -hmm. up. But what I can say is, he had a grandchild that was born that way, and and the grandchild did not live long. The grandchild died, and it made him feel so guilty about what he had done mm. that he felt compelled to con to confess, if you will. And mm. I remember saying to him, "Why are you telling me this? Why don't you tell a priest?" And he said, right. "A priest would judge me, and I can tell you won't." Why wouldn't you judge him? I'd judge him.